Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brainwaves Podcast. I'm Jamie Adams. Now, before we get started today, I'm just going to let you know I had a bad orange juice today. So my stomach has been doing backflips like you wouldn't believe. So if I. Bad orange juice. It was bad orange juice. It literally was bad orange juice. I shouldn't have left it there for a couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> I forgot about it. Yeah, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. But yeah, so I might be a bit quieter tonight. Just letting you all know. Uh, spoil- spoilers, he will not be a bit quieter. No, I probably won't. I'll try and be a bit quieter because my stomach, it listens. If I talk about how bad it is, it'll listen and be bad. And I don't know where I'm going with this. But we're fulfilling our obligation to you, as we say at the end of most stories. Um, if there are updates, we will keep you posted. And it is update palooza. We have not one, not two, but th- no. Not one, not two, not three, but four updates for you on various stories. So, And I haven't introduced myself yet. I'm Ian McAllister, and this is Brainwaves episode 94, bringing you the best in tabletop gaming news. These are the headlines for the week of 21st of March, 2022. Tabletop RPGs reach for the stars, and the sale of Asthma Day is completed, and new companies jump on board their USA arm. All this and more on this episode of Brainwaves. The Nebula Awards are an annual set of honorifics handed out every year by the science fiction and fantasy writers of America. Originally conceived in 1966, they were initially only about literary works. Over time, they've grown to include a film and television script category, though that hasn't been given out every year since 1974, its induction. And in 2018, they included a game writing award for the very first time. This year, that game writing category has peeked into the world of tabletop RPGs for the very first time, and has come up with a few nominees. Those are Coyote and Crow, which features a post-apocalyptic setting designed by Native Americans in a history where colonialism never happened. Written by Connor Alexander, William Mackay, Wayodi Oldbear, Derek Pounds, Nico Albert, Rihanna Elliott, Diogo Noguera, and William Thompson of Coyote and Crow LLC, a self-published work. Grandma's Hand, an RPG which reimagines the golden age of hero comics with black protagonists. Written by Balogun Ojitade and a self-published work. Thirsty Sword Lesbians is, and quoting from the game page, a role-playing game for telling queer stories with friends. If you love angsty disaster lesbians with swords, you've come to the right place. Written by April Kit Walsh, Whitney DeLaggio, Dominique Dickey, Jonia Kemper, Alexis Sara, Ray Najadi, and published by Evil Hat Productions. And Wonder Home, written by Jay Dragon and published by Possum Creek Games. It takes inspiration from games such as Animal Crossing and films like Spirited Away and The Oeuvre of Hayao Miyazaki, and sees you telling a collective story about anthropomorphized animals in a pastoral world. Aww. Additionally, in that game's category is only one other finalist, and that is Wildermyth a computer game that Ian's enjoyed playing a bit of. Um, I believe I watched you play it. It's a tactical RPG with a series of um, kind of storybook... It unfolds like a storybook narrative, and uh, the story unfolds in different ways depending on the choices you make in the game. And Jamie was an excellent narrator as uh, as he watched on. Was that the one where I was like Jimmy Stewart for one character and a really bad Christopher Walken for the other? And That, that is that one, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not going to knock more awards. This is really interesting to see more tabletop uh, games being entered in the Nebula Awards. And that's a big deal. Yeah, a big cultural award that usually goes to literature uh, or written scripts, like uh, TV written scripts, film written scripts, and now looking at the world of tabletop RPGs. Fantastic to see. Great to see that acknowledgement. And uh, we'll bring you updates on a winner when that is announced. Back in episode 89, we reported on the sale of Asmodee to Embracer Group for 2.7 billion euros. That sale has now completed on March the 8th, alongside the acquisition of Dark Horse Media on March the 14th. As we reported at the time, Asmodee will function as an independent division of Embracer, and there are currently no plans to change its operations, structure or management team. It's worth noting that Dark Horse has approximately 300 intellectual properties to its name that could be developed for games and have been developed for games in the past. But that's not all from the world's largest tabletop games company. 
Asmodee USA a few days ago announced the six new partnerships for distribution of games in the United States. Those six companies are Mendifius, with an exclusive to publish the Spectre board game, which is one I didn't know they were making, and Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, the adventure game, or the game with the most sort of subtitles I've seen yet. Parabellum Games for their Conquest line of games. Spin Master with games like Marvel United and Marvel Zombies. Skytear Games with Skytear, and that will also include distribution to the UK, Australia and New Zealand. Transatlantis Games with the Duncan Rhodes paint line. And Road to Infamy with their entire catalogue, including Canvas amongst them. Ian, what's Canvas? I'm intrigued. Uh, I don't know much about Canvas, but it is a game about making uh, pictures, basically, and you use transparent cards. So every card is like, basically, it's got some kind of drawing drawing bit on it, and the rest of the card is transparent. They're punched on some plastic, and you sort of layer these cards together to make different um, pictures. Oh, I have yeah, heard and, of this. And, yes. and, and score, po- score points based on how good your pictures are. I don't really know how the game works, but oh. basically it's that. You've uh, yeah. got that sort of putting things together yeah that, that very very old disney style of creating like the 3d looking for yeah um, yeah basically and, uh, like car i think the first time i remember seeing transparent cards using the game was gloom yes the gloom i think series of games they use that that's the first time i remember ever seeing that mechanic yeah so now the sales complete it'll be interesting to see what if anything changes as my day obviously they've got their long-term financial future a bit more secure now uh, so will they continue to acquire other companies as they have been over yes. the last sort of five, ten years? Probably. Will they take some risks, maybe? We'll see. Yes. Sometimes big companies take risks. Sometimes big companies come away from taking risks. So they want a return for their investment. So, yeah, we'll see what happens over the next little while. Uh, that's all we have for headlines just now. But now it's time for Update Palooza. I would say update a palooza, but technically part of that second headline about asthma day is also part of an update, therefore making it update number five. Five game updates. It's update a palooza, folks. Wow. Oops, we love we've it, got, folks. We've got a new jingle, apparently. <laughs> no, we don't. No, we do not. Back in November of last year, n- and not November as was written here by accident, I think that was me. On episode 85, we reported on the case being brought against Vinath Odumozin of Dublin, Georgia, United States of America. The case alleged that he had misappropriated COVID recovery funds he was given. He had posed as a business in order to obtain an $85,000 loan under that scheme. He used $57,789 of that loan to buy a rare Pokemon card, which at the time made it the 10th most expensive Pokemon card ever. And before you ask, yes, it was a Charizard. First edition, super rare. This one was also super rarer, super rare, because it was meant to be a shiny card, but it wasn't shiny and it didn't have a shadow on it which are errors unique to that card and thus making it super valuable and super sought after. He has been sentenced to three years in prison and has forfeited the card as part of a plea agreement. And apparently, no decision has been reached now on what to do with the Pokemon card, which currently resides as property of the United States government. So currently, President Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. can just walk in and go, there's a Charizard. I mean, I don't think Joe Biden would know what Charizard is. It's a dragon. I'm taking that. Well, if you play with Charizards, Jamie, you're going to get burned. Oh, very good. Update number two. Yes, indeed. It is TSR versus Wizards round 364. TSR, not that one. Or, or that, that one. one. Or that one. Uh, is once more back in the news due to the ongoing suit between TSR and Wizards of the Coast. Uh, this time it is Wizards going after new TSR with a suit that basically boils down to the fact that TSR using anything to do with Dungeons & Dragons will make people associate their product with Wizards of the Coast. As it stands, I checked this out the other day, this suit is now suspended uh, as of the 27th January, so we're unsure exactly as to what the status of this suit is, whether it's been sailed out of court or whether something else has been brought down the line. 
but there's a little bit of analysis about this on a couple of Twitter feeds I read, and Wizards have got some fairly heavy legal hitters, as you'd expect, and TSR do not. It does not look good for, for them. Jimmy, update number four, or three, depending on how you look, or you're counting it. In episode 39, we detailed the Medium article written by Victoria Mann. In that article, she detailed her relationship with the game designer J.R. Honeycutt and the abuse she suffered at his hands. Now, episode 39 was back in 2019. Honeycutt is now suing Victoria for defamation and intentional infliction of emotional damages. Victoria outlines the suit in the GoFundMe she's put together, where she's seeking to raise $15,000 for her defence. According to Victoria, he's suing her for half a million dollars. Links in the show notes will, of course, be there for the GoFundMe. We'd like to remind listeners that when the allegations came out, Honeycutt posted this as part of his apology. First, I apologise to Victoria for all the hurt expressed in her post, and for the other times I've hurt her or other women in my life. He does refute in that same post that he was physically or sexually abusive. Again, links in the show notes. A number of well-known designers and publishers in the tabletop world distanced themselves from Honeycutt when the original allegations came out, including Rob Davio, the man behind Legacy Games, Gil Hover of the studio behind The Networks, successful TV, Pandasaurus Games, Restoration Games, co-owned by Rob Davio, and the Indie Game Alliance, what do you think, Ian? Personally, I think this is not going to go well for GR Honeycutt. I'd just like to let our listeners know that Victoria has reached her initial target of $15,000. Currently, her GoFundMe is set, sitting at $17,295. Uh, we're recording this on the 18th of March. Uh, but yeah, to me, this this sounds like someone who's like been thinking about this for a while like just letting it sort of boil over and according to victoria he is friends with a lawyer who has helped put him put this suit together i honestly don't know how well it's going to go for him he basically apologized not fully it was a bit of a half-hearted apology but there's an apology out there in the world for people to read and now he's trying to sue her for emotional damage basically and reputational damage to something he has copped to it, I, I don't know. These things can go bad for the victims, unfortunately. So I hope it, it comes out in Victoria's favour. I hope so too. Anyway, we're not done with people being terrible in the tabletop industry because, you know, we never are. Back in episodes 82 and 83, we covered the controversy around tournament fishing, a board game that was on Kickstarter at the time and had blatant far-right symbols as part of its advertising campaign and art assets. This game was published by The Gaming Goat, an organisation run by a man called Jeff Bergen. The Gaming Goat also runs an online store. On that store, they sell a game that has recently started to reach backers called Creature Comfort from Kids Table Board Gaming, or KTBG. Or, as The Gaming Goat put it on the listing for this game on their site, Creature Comforts, brackets, SJW Racist Publisher. The Gaming Goat go on to say this in the description of the product. The host publisher of this title denied a Muslim female of colour the ability to review a board game based on her race and background. She then partnered with another Canadian designer, Jay Cormier, to ban the sale of games to members of the LGBTQ community, African Americans and other people of colour in the United States. Jay Cormier and this publisher were openly warned that this activity was inappropriate and continued their inappropriate conduct. They are also extremely rude and demeaning to certain members of our staff and have only openly conducted business with retailers as long as their owners are white males. This behaviour is extremely inappropriate and it will not be tolerated. This is on their the Gaming Goats webpage. They run basically an online shop as well and they are still selling this game. They apparently vehemently disagree with the publisher. We're not totally sure what the Gaming Goat is trying to achieve here. It looks like they're just trying to stir the pot a bit, stir up trouble. We didn't really cover the incident that is being described here. We know who it was between, but we're not going to name names on this at the moment. We've reached out for comment from KTBG because we're not sure they're aware of this listing or what it's saying. I don't know much about the publisher at all, so I can't really out and out defend them i do know they're a sponsor of our family plays games a group that are very 
into their advocacy for people of color and LGBTQ people coming into the community and are very well regarded. I don't think they would partner with a publisher accused of this sort of thing if there was any truth to the matter. We'll bring you more on this in the next cast, probably, because I think this is only just coming to light that this is a thing. We we only we only saw the listing in the last day or so, so we don't think it's actually filtered into the board game world as yet. So we'll bring you more on this on the next cast. Anyway, that's enough for updates. That was a lot of them. On to a little bit of news. The 1980s seminal dungeon crawler Hero Quest was re-released last year to a wave of publicity running the gamut from excited to disgruntled. After this, the Commander of the Guardian at Night's miniatures pack was announced in America. Now, a petition has been launched on the online petition site Change.org calling on Hasbro to re-release the pack. In its description, the organisers say... Despite being from a clearly popular and high-demand game, the pre-orders for the pack were extremely limited, and that many pre-orders weren't honoured, with the majority being cancelled on the day of release. As of now, these sets are being sold by scalpers for 900% price increases, with many charging as much as $400 to $500 for the $15 set. Currently, at time of recording, 153 people have signed this. If you hunger for those minis, then by all means... Go and have a look, see what happens. It's the same old story across crowdfunding in, in some regards. You know, yeah. crowdfunding exclusive content becomes highly desirable and lucrative. Now that's agreeable up to a point, but I don't think actually that goes very far if this is to be believed that uh, it was produced in such limited numbers that many people had pre-orders cancelled as a separate like uh, announcement. It's it's a weird one from a company as big as Hasbro as well because they they did this through their own crowdfunding site, uh, which is a little bit questionable in and of itself. I mean, I can understand why they're using the power of crowdfunding to do slightly more niche products because, as we've discussed many times on this cast before, it gives companies the money before they have to actually do the printing. But yeah, it's, it would seem like this is an easy problem for Hasbro to solve in terms of publicity and PR, but maybe they're just not willing to, and maybe they just. The demand's not quite as much as these people think it is. It's hard to tell. Mm. A little update from Games Workshop now. Games Workshop has announced that they will not be selling any Warhammer product in Russia as a result of the invasion of Ukraine. In a short statement released on the Warhammer community site on the 16th of March, Games Workshop said, We didn't take this decision lightly. We know that there are many Russian hobbyists who don't condone the war, yet we must stand with those suffering. A good stance from Games Workshop, and I don't know if we'll see other board game companies follow suit. I know well, I know we've seen Stonemire in our last cast. We talked about a couple of companies that have said they won't be dealing with uh, their Russian localization companies. Like so, Stonemire said that. I don't know if we'll see any other companies say that, or whether this, they're just too small to have an impact. But it's good to see a big company like Games Workshop um, doing something about that. Anyway, Jamie, on to other games. Sport ball. Sport ball! Yeah, I meant to tell you, in that football's coming home. To my home. It's coming home. It's coming home, man. Football's coming home. The to world your home co- or mine? Well. Do I, need to, like, do I need to make drinks and snacks? You will have to put out some extra chairs. The World Cup is being held in England in 2024. No, sorry, I misread that. Um, the Subutio World Cup is being held in England in 2024. Created by Peter Adolf, Tunbridge Wells resident, in 1946 and originally produced and sold from Langton Green in Kent, Subutio has been played all around the world. And now the Subutio FISTF, or FISTF, the Federation of International Sport Table Football, the World Cup will be played in Tunbridge Wells Leisure Centre in September of 2024. It beat out hosting bids from Brazil and Greece, but Brazil allegedly withdrew its bid when they found out that the home of the game would be part of the consideration. It is expected that 32 countries will be involved in this World Cup, with 64 tables being in use at any one time. At the council meeting where the announcement was made, Councillor Jane March said, 
This will be a huge event for the town and the wider borough, and we're confident it will reawaken and unite Subutio fans and table football fans from all over the world. Marvellous. I mean, I have no interest in Subutio, but I love that. I, I think my dad or my older brother maybe both, had a Sibutio set. So I played it a bit when I was Wii. Of course, I didn't play it properly. But I love that it's still going incredibly strongly. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. It's just a part of the ta- like. It's part of the tabletop gaming hobby for sure, but it's just a part that we don't really consider in the sort of modern hobby games. In, which, which is strange because it's, it's, you know, it is huge and it's... It's, it's always a thing where you see a cons, you see a bunch of football games, don't you? Every single like big convention, you see like two or three football games. And that always strikes me as odd. But then you think back to like, Subutio is pretty old. Subutio is pretty old, 1946, as I said. And as you said, it's a sport game that has gone on for that many years. I mean, that is amazing. You keep going, oh, people don't do sport games well. Yeah, Subutio, say what you like about it. Again, like, I guess Monopoly or some of that. It's still hugely popular indeed anyway we just and, like to take uh, a moment what, just... one last one last thing of course there are probably football fans out there who are listening to this going i mean jamie the world cup's not going to be held in 2024 because 2024 is a euros year the next world cup's going to be 2026 after qatar this year and i say that's true ian if you're going to make a joke about they always walk it in i am going to leave <laughs> the podcast right now <laughs> <sighs> Nothing about ludicrous displays, okay? I actually quite like the World Cup, and I will fight you on this. <laughs> anyway, one team that we won't be abandoning is our lovely, lovely patrons. Thank you so much for uh, continuing to support the cast, especially our executive producers, James Naylor and Sean Newman. For, uh, we'll link to all of James and Sean's bits and pieces in the show notes. You can join them for only $1 a month to get an extended version of the cast. Uh, there are a variety of ways to support us on the site. And before we get out of here and move on to a little bit of outro news, we'd just like to remind you that Tabletop Scotland will be happening in Perth, Scotland over the weekend of the 27th and 28th of August this year. Tickets go on sale on the 31st of March. And it's going to be a good time. With Jamie and I are planning to be there. Uh, they're starting to put together all the exhibitors halls. It's going to be a little bit bigger than it was last year, I think. And yeah, it's gonna it's looking good. Can he wait? Can he wait? Yeah, it's going to be one of the only conventions I get to this year, so I'm really looking forward to it. Right. Before we go, it's time for the Monopoly news. And I have got a great one for you today. I have... Uh, um... Did you forget again? I, I didn't forget. I, I had one, but I thought it's kind of closely related to Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, and I kind of didn't want to give that the oxygen of publicity, or as the great comedian Linda Smith once said, give it the oxygen of oxygen, to be fair. Well, in this that case, Jamie, you need to have faith. Faith in the future of tabletop RPGs. A new project on Kickstarter has garnered some attention, as it is the first in a series of planned RPGs inspired by the band Faith No More. Named after the band's third album, The Real Thing is an official collaboration with the group. Each subsequent game will also be named after one of the band's albums, and this one takes inspiration from 1990s RPGs such as Vampire the Masquerade and other World of Darkness titles. The Real Thing will release as a 110-page design-style game and will release in a digital format in June and physical in October, assuming that the campaign succeeds. So I want you to tell me, Jamie, which band should inspire an RPG? Which of you, which band do you love that should inspire an RPG? Or just which band would make a good RPG? Okay, I don't know which band would make a good RPG. I mean, you've got things, you know, you're going for, like, classic rock. Like, I mean, I would say Led Zeppelin, but... A bunch of Led Zeppelin songs are just Lord of the Rings references. I mean, Highlander is basically the Queen RPG, right? <laughs> oh, I mean, in many ways. Yeah, but you can say that about Flash Gordon. Yep, yep. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. I mean, so Queen, Queen could do multiple genres, sci-fi and fantasy. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of GURP. <laughs> so that's like the kind of, uh, like a, a very generic one. Um, you've are got, you calling Queen very generic? No, I am not. I'm not. What I'm saying is their ability to do multiple worlds. First thought is things like, you know, sensational alex harvey band it's like it's it, it's punk it's it's cool 
it's nice and weird and Alex Harvey is weird and he, he's great. And then my thought is things like Iron Maiden or Sabaton, you know, these metal bands are, they, they do a lot of history and literature. Well, literature more for Iron Maiden. Sabaton's all about that history of war. So it's going to be like war-based RPGs and stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, folks, please write into us and let us know which band you think would inspire an RPG or get in contact with us on Twitter or come and talk to us in our Discord. Thank you very much for listening. If you like what you've listened to, then the best way to help us out is to share the podcast and drop us a review and rating on iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You'll mostly be able to get in touch with us through Twitter, or you can come and talk to us directly on our Discord. There'll be an invite for you in the show notes. Our website is thegiantbrain.co.uk and you can email us about which band you think would make a great RPG at giantbrainuk at gmail.com. Thanks very much. Bye-bye for now. Goodbye. <laughs>